Are they engaged? Um, meeting his girlfriend's family. <laughs> and the wedding should be while they're over there, I think. Not positive. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, of course, our Bible college staff are starting to come back. Alex and Curtis are coming back this week. So, and we got, we got people coming. Uh, Julie's already here. Where are you, Julie? She's around here somewhere. So, Bible college staff is, is uh, beginning to kind of find their way back. A big, huh? Oh, Nicole, where are you? Oh, there you are. I didn't even get a chance to see you yet. Welcome back. Nice to have you. We missed you. And uh, I, I'm sure you missed our weather. Uh, <laughs> Let's see, Jeff Rivera. I, I, I neglected to thank him last week for doing such a great job in, uh, in um, teaching the Word two weeks ago on the rapture of the church and second coming of Christ. It was a real blessing. Also want to uh, say that Jonathan Junker and his wife Melissa, six months, been married. Uh, they're back. He's a Bible college student, so really good to have them. If you know them, make sure to say hi. And then I had the privilege of uh, being a part of... Uh, John and, and uh, Katie's suitor ceremony yesterday. That was a real privilege. So they're married, and uh, yay. <clears throat> hey, clap like you know them. There you go. <clears throat> That's it. Faithful servants of the Lord that, uh, that are serving him on the mainland as well. So it was a real privilege to to get to know them. And uh, today we have to say goodbye to a couple of people. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Danielle to come. And Connor, are you here? Where's Connor? There you are. Would you mind coming up? You can bring your family if you want. Bring your sisters with you. You got to bring your sisters and your family because Danielle's bringing that whole row of girls with her. You don't want to come up by yourself. Otherwise, it's me and you. Okay, come on. We're going to say goodbye to these uh, uh, young, uh, young people. Uh, Connors uh, and his family, the Burns family, I, by the way, they didn't know they was going to ask him up here, so they're, they're not ready or prepared for this. They're just coming because I asked them to. And um, anyway, the Burns family, a wonderful family, and then, of course, Danielle and her sister, Sabrina, and then, oh, the rest of you aren't willing to come up, I see. Only some of you are willing to get up here. Okay. So we want to say goodbye to them. Uh, Danielle's going to be going to California, and she's going to be spending time with family. She works for Dukes down here uh, in Kalapaki. And when are you leaving? Thursday. Are you still working a couple more shifts, or are you done? Oh, all the discounts for all of us. Can't you get us in there? for? <laughs> so we want to pray for her and ask the Lord's blessing on her. And Connor, I don't even, I'm not even sure I know where you're going. California. Okay, California. <laughs> Somewhere in California. San Francisco. Uh, yeah. San Francisco. Okay. They're both kind of adventuring. You know, they just want to spread their wings a little bit. That happens if you, uh, if you live on the island. You get to a certain point where you just, I want to see the rest of the world. So they're going to go see the rest of the world. And so we want to, we want to pray a blessing on them. And uh, we want to sing to them. So uh, let, me, let us sing first. And then uh, you're going to have to help me uh, with this. We'll, we'll sing our song of blessing to them. And then we'll, we'll pray for them. Uh, let's see, how does it go? Okay, okay, here it is, okay. Aloha, may you know his peace. Aloha, may he guide and keep. Be faithful, be true, until at his feet. Redeemed we shall say, aloha. Father, we thank you so much for Danielle and uh, her life, so much for Connor and his life, Father. We're so thankful for the intersection of our lives together for the time that we've had. And we're looking forward to seeing them again. And uh, we pray your blessing on them as they venture off uh, the island of Kauai and they um, uh, seek your will for their lives and uh, enjoy new experiences and make new friends and uh, enjoy new fellowships and new churches and discover how amazing the body of Christ is because there's love and there's servants all over the world that call on the name of Christ and they're going to discover that and uh, they're going to enjoy that. I pray that you'd make them useful wherever they go, that they would be servants of the Most High God and servants of the Bride of Christ and that they would be blessed uh, with every good thing that you have planned for them. And so have your hands on them and favor them, honor them, uh, keep them close to your heart, be with their families. I know everybody's going to miss them, we'll miss them. And, uh, and we ask God for a, a return in your timing for either a visit or, or a reunion of, uh, of our lives together. So we thank you for them and pray your blessing would rest on them in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, we're going to miss you guys. So make sure to pray for them. They've been important parts of our fellowship for many years. Okay, let's turn to the book of, uh, of Matthew. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 20 today as we continue our study uh, through the 
Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we'll be in chapter 20, and we'll be looking at the first 16 verses. But we're going to back up for context uh, purpose to the last verse in chapter 19, and we'll begin there. Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out at the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to the steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when, he, when, he, but, uh, when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had all received it, or when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this man, the last man, the same as to you. It is, not law, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture today. And, and we're coming with just an eagerness and a joy, uh, having fully enjoyed worship and honoring your name and God, fellowshipping and loving each other, we're coming and we're asking God that you would open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to the things of your kingdom. Reveal yourself to us. Show yourself what you're really like and help us to see what we're like and what you want to make us. And so, Holy Spirit, I've done my homework, I'm prepared, but I have no confidence in myself. And I'm asking that you would fill me. And as, even as I prayed last night, I, I know there's a major difference between a good sermon, and a spirit-led uh, teaching on the Word of God that inspires and lifts and raises people up. And so, God, I'm praying that, that you would take and breathe life into what you've given me and that you would favor and be kind and that you would bless every man and every woman and every young person here today with what they need and what you want to give. And so have your way. And we want to say thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I've entitled the message, No Man's Debtor, um, because, of course, God is no man's debtor. Sometimes uh, we treat God like he is our debtor. And uh, it takes a form of probably one of the most famous phrases in the world that we've ever said, that anyone's ever uttered, and it starts from almost the time that we can start talking, is that's not fair. Uh, we hear it from children. We, we hear it on the playground. Uh, we hear it from employees when somebody gets promoted or, or is overlooked or when someone is promoted and, and another person doesn't even have the skill sets that you've got and they get a better paycheck than you do. We hear it from pro athletes who demand these multi-million dollar, multi-year contracts only to find out that two years later they're complaining because somebody else got a better payday than they did in another contract. Uh, we hear it from even people that are fairly reasonable and loving siblings once an inheritance is, is introduced into the equation. We, we all say this and feel this at various times that life is not fair. Uh, when we're young, we say it out loud because we don't know better. And as we mature, we become more refined in how we say, that's not fair, you know, and stamp our feet. Uh, but we, we know that doesn't look right for an adult to do that. So we find more refined ways to do it. And sometimes those ways are just private in our heart. And we feel like that's not right. That's not fair. 
I think what happens is that we have a, a, a brokenness in us that's incited and, and encouraged by Satan himself to believe that we have certain rights and that we've got certain entitlements and that there's certain things that, that we should be expecting in life. And sometimes that sense of, of having rights and entitlements and, and high expectations can lead us to great disappointments and sometimes even disappointments with God. I've had my own disappointments with God. I, I shared last night that I had a conversation with the Lord many, many years ago, probably, probably I'd say 12 years ago. And um, on Mondays, I, I enjoy spending about half the day just praying and worshiping and spending time in the Word uh, down at, uh, at Lydgate Beach. And I go for long walks and pray and I just really enjoy my fellowship with the Lord. But I remember at one particular difficult season of my life uh, that, I, that I really had a little complaint session with God. And that really isn't something I normally have done or did. And I, and I really haven't done much of that since because God really busted me on this particular occasion. But I had a conversation with God, and I said, God, you know, this isn't right, you know, what, what, what's happening. Why aren't you answering my prayer? Why aren't you responding? Why aren't you delivering? Why aren't you rescuing? And I actually said this to God out loud. I said, God, I wouldn't treat the employees at church like you're treating me. <laughs> that's a pastor that's laughing loudest right now because he, he knows exactly what I'm talking about, you know. But the, that sense of, I, I, why are you treating me this way? And, you know, I, I felt I had to confess my sin later. But the point was that I felt in my heart is, wow, God, you know, I'm pouring myself out. I'm doing everything I can. And, God, you're not, you're not living up to my expectations. You're not even as good as I am. <laughs> wow. That came out of me out loud. Not in a nasty voice, but it came out. And I repented of that later, that day, and I realized how wrong I was. But here, here I am, I'm a grown man, and I've been in ministry at that point for probably 20 plus years. And I felt that I was being treated wrongly by God because I had a certain sense of, right, sense of rights, entitlements, and expectations that he wasn't meeting in my time frame. And this particular text addresses some of that concern about rights and entitlements. We all have them. Every person in here has a sense of injustice and a sense that you have not been answered quickly enough by God and that God has not fulfilled his promises. All these things we know are not true. We know they're lies. We know they're not even necessarily completely rational, but we feel them and we express them because underlying all of that is this premise that we begin with that's wrong. Now, in this particular parable, about the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ is going to correct some of the faulty presuppositions of these particular workers. And of course, it's not the workers themselves because the parable is a parable. It's really the people of Israel. It's the religious leaders. It's the people that are following Christ at this point. It's even the disciples. Because if you remember, and remember the context of this passage, the rich young ruler was, was the thing that Matthew had just revealed to us uh, in chapter 19, who wasn't willing to give up his, his riches to follow after Christ. And then Peter blurts out, what are we going to get for giving up everything? And it's on the heels of that question, what are we going to get? But what is that? That's raised expectation, isn't it? He's saying if this guy is not going to get in because he gave up nothing and we gave up everything, oh boy, what are we going to get? And so now Jesus is going to answer that question. And it's a bit surprising. It's got some twists and turns in it, but it's got a life-changing message, and I'm hoping and praying that God is going to use it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be clear that God is no man's debtor. So in verse 1, the parable begins with workers being hired. A landowner of a vineyard goes out. Now, this landowner, um, there's, there's always interesting things about the text of the Bible to me that are not necessarily just right on the surface. But this person obviously was a, uh, an entrepreneur, a self-starter, a risk taker. This guy is working without a net. Uh, they, he's investing everything. Uh, he gets up early and works late. He doesn't punch a clock. Uh, he's, got, he's got no... Uh, no help, there's no vacation time, there's no guaranteed paycheck, there's no sick leave, there's no free health care or free low-income housing or welfare. There's nothing for this guy. He's either got to make it or not. And so everything rides on him. And I have a great admiration for people like this, by the way, uh, because there is so much risk in 
in uh, being an entrepreneur. Many of you are entrepreneurs in our church. You own your own businesses. Uh, you make things go. You create jobs. You create a, a tax basis for, you know, our roads and our infrastructure here. Never mind. I'm, skip the roads part. I'm not going to... I don't want you to feel... <laughs> That's not really fair to make you feel like that had anything to do with that at all here on Kauai. Uh, but you, you provide for the infrastructure of this island, and, you, and you're doing so much, and it all rides on you. And this man is just like you. And so he's got a job. He's got a field. He has a vineyard. And, um, you know, usually when I'm going through a text like this, I'll kind of share the, the interpretation of this scripture as we go along or at the end. I'm going to tell you the interpretation right now. Uh, because I have other things I want to concentrate on in the text, but I want you to understand the proper interpretation. The parables, when Jesus teaches these, uh, have patterns. And when a a definition for a particular type of of, um, uh, person or event or sequence of things occurs, it's repeated over and over. And once that definition is established, it it, uh, carries on through the rest of Scripture. So the landowner in in the parables of Jesus always refers to God. It's always God or Jesus Christ. And when we look at the vineyard, it's always the world. It's the, it's the harvest field of the unbelieving world. And, th- and that's, the, that's the vineyard. And then the, the harvest itself represents the souls of mankind. So the, the, the field is, the, is the, uh, the world, and of course the harvest are those that are being uh, gleaned out of the world into a relationship with God. The believers are, or the laborers are believers in Jesus Christ who are part of that work in bringing in the harvest, and of course the wage represents the believer's compensation. So this man uh, goes out early in the morning. He's motivated because everything rides on, on his design. No one's pushing him. No one's making him do this. He has a heart to work. He has a heart to produce, and so he goes out. He gets up early before dawn because the time that's indicated here is 6 a.m. approximately, but at dawn, he's out on the roadside, and he's looking for laborers. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Some of you have uh, been to California. Some of you have been overseas. Uh, But anywhere there is a third world community or a third world population or a third world uh, government, uh, what you'll find is you'll find people on the side of the road uh, that want to be hired. Uh, Anybody go through LA and their barrios and their different places where you can see this taking place. Now in the United States, we don't generally get hired that way. Uh, We don't even have this on Kauai. Nobody on Kauai goes out down into Kapa'a and sits on the side of the road saying uh, a sign with all their gear and their painting equipment or their their stucco equipment or whatever, their plumbing or electrical equipment. But in other parts of the world and in uh, places where there are are immigrant populations in the United States, people do that. And and that's exactly how people were uh, presented as laborers in the Old Testament, New Testament as well. There were people, however, that had um, their own shops, they had their own storefront, they had their own business and establishment, but these guys that are lining the road are a different breed. These guys don't have the resources, they don't have their act quite as much together, uh, they don't have the, the, the finances, they don't have the backing, they haven't succeeded at this point uh, to the point where they're able to just sit in the shop and, and take the calls and set up the appointments, and it's all on them to feed their families. And so this landowner goes into town in the marketplace <clears throat> to where he knows he's going to find this row of guys and uh, people that are, that are ready and available and willing to work. As I was writing all these things down, I just, I just kind of accidentally created an acronym of war. They're creating a war on poverty for their families by being willing and available and ready to work. They've got their tools. They're out there. They, they, there's no net for them either, no, no safety net. They've got to provide. And so they go out there and they're praying and they're, and they're crying out to God and they're doing whatever they can to make themselves attractive to a potential uh, person that might hire them, an employer. And uh, so the, the, uh, the landowner comes along and he sees these guys out there and he, and he hires some of these laborers and they agree upon a denarius. I love the word agree. It's symphoneo. might sound just a little bit like symphony because it's where we get symphony from. It means to come into a place of harmony with another person in agreement. And so the landowner and the laborers come to a place of symphoneo where they are in agreement, in harmony, about being paid a day's wage. A denarius 
is a day's wage, a full day's wage for a 12-hour workday, and we complain about our eight-hour workdays. This is 12 hours from sunrise to sunset is the workday for a laborer at that time. And uh, actually, in some of your translations, it says a penny uh, because that was a, a full day's wage. Um, so at the time, you know, inflation, everything else, here we are. Uh, that wouldn't do us very well today, but it did for them at the time. And so they agreed upon this, and then they went into the vineyard, and they did, of course, what they were supposed to do. We have no uh, information about their work ethic. We have nothing about how, how hard they worked or if there was a comparison between the workers. We don't have any of that. The purpose of the parable isn't concentrating on that. It's concentrating on another uh, uh, purpose. And then we find in verse 3 and 4 that the uh, landowner has such a harvest that the laborers that he's got aren't sufficient. So he comes back to the marketplace at 9 o'clock and he finds more people standing in the marketplace and instructs them to go to his vineyard. And now he doesn't promise them any particular wage. He says, I'll just pay you a fair wage. This is different from the first group. First group promised a particular wage. This group just promised that he would be fair. Again, at 12 and at 3, he did the same thing in verse 5. And uh, so he didn't just show up once in the marketplace, but this landowner, realizing that he can use more workers and more workers, he keeps going back and finding more laborers to help in the vineyard. Verse 6 and 7. The landowner goes again at 5 p.m. Now, this is the 11th hour because we're 11 hours into the day. The sun sets at 6, so it's the 11th hour. And he goes back, and he's looking for people again. And he says to them, essentially, why aren't you guys working? You know, why hasn't anyone hired you? And he says, because nobody's hired us. We're still here. Now, let me ask you something. Of those workers that are left, after all the employers and, and hires uh, and business people throughout the day have been hiring from that marketplace, what caliber of people are left? <laughs> no, they're probably the scruffy-looking ones. The ones whose toolboxes look really beat up, the, the guy that looks like he's not really that competent, the, the person that, uh, that isn't really excited and on the side of the road saying, pick me, pick me. He doesn't have the sandwich board sign and flipping the thing. And, you know, he's not doing any of that. He's just like dejected on the side of the road. That's the caliber of people that we're looking at. I, there's so much in here. I wish I had time to, to, to go deeper on some of these things. But suffice it to say that... Um, that the Lord is looking for laborers as well. And uh, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord are ranging throughout the earth to support those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. In 1 Corinthians 1, uh, chapter 1, it tells us that not many of us were wise, not many mighty, not many noble. We're kind of like the scruffy people left at the end at times. And sometimes some of you feel that way. Um, it doesn't matter what size group that, uh, that uh, anybody, you, you know, this particular size group or, uh, you know, a small group of, of a handful of people or thousands of people, you're going to find people that feel like they're the cat's meow, that they're the best thing since sliced bread and you should pick me. And they're bold and they're confident. And then you've got the people that are absolutely dejected feeling like, you know, I, I already know no one's going to pick me, so why even bother? And, and the beautiful thing that's kind of hidden in this parable is that God picks everybody. He makes it possible for everybody to be able to be a part of his work. And why? Because the Bible says in Luke chapter 10 that the, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And, and Jesus even says to the disciples, pray therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. I want to tell you something, that the harvest is amazing right now on Kauai. I, I used to be convinced, like so many Christians, that, that, that unbelievers didn't want to come to Christ. And I was almost like the dejected worker that's like, nobody's, they're not going to respond. They're not going to, you know, why bother? And I am totally convinced that that's a lie from the enemy. Do you know that statistically, that more people are coming to Christ right now globally than any other time in human history? Would you have imagined that from watching the news? Oh, we're on the run. We got our tail between our legs. We're getting beat up. Christians are... Are, are almost at the point of extinction. Isn't that what you get in the news? And somebody's got to rescue us. Not so. God's on the move. And there's a great harvest. And God even today is looking for labors. He's looking for men and women that will, that will step past the, the, uh, 
the expectations and the sense of entitlement and the sense of rights that govern their lives, and they'll step into this great work that God has called us to be a part of, which is the Great Commission. It doesn't mean that you abandon your life or your family or your, your house or your material things. It means that you use all of them to advance that cause. And whatever you're doing, you are a people that are advancing the cause of Christ and doing His will. And so this, uh, um, this landowner goes out, and even at the latest hour of 5 p.m., just an hour before the sun goes down, he's out hiring people, which means that those hires are only going to be working for, what, maybe half an hour? I mean, they got to get to his vineyard. I don't know how long it takes to get there, half an hour, 15 minutes, but they're not working even a full hour. And I, I find that so amazing that it doesn't matter whether you come to Christ early or late. Some of you have been Christians since for 50 years, and some of you have just come to Christ in the last year in the last few months, we've got a bunch of you here that are just brand new Christians. And everybody is, is a part of this kingdom work. And, and here's the crazy part. We're going to get to it, but there seems to be equality in the reward, which is the answer, the basis of this question that's being brought up in this text altogether is, is this how God treats us? Is that everybody gets the same thing, no matter whether you've been working for 50 years for Christ or three months? And that kind of grates on us, doesn't it? There's something about that that sounds socialistic and communistic, doesn't it? <laughs> Say, yes, it does. <laughs> and if you are a, a true blue, red, red, white, and blue American with a sense of freedom, that, that's not nice. We know that communism doesn't work. We know that socialism doesn't work because what's, what's lacking in those, those two political ideologies is incentive. Because when you take from people who have motivation and give to people that won't work and are not motivated, you, you de-incentivize the people who are motivated, the entrepreneur. And pretty soon they're saying to themselves, why bother? Why work so hard? We're all going to get the same thing anyway. Why am I knocking myself out? Why am I working 16-hour days? Why am I taking all the risk? And they just slowly begin to stop working and being motivated. And in the end, you have the fruit of socialism and communism, which is poverty. Not just of the pocketbook, but of the soul. And it appears that this text might be teaching that, is that it doesn't matter. But I want to share something with you is that uh, as this pay plan kind of works itself out, we find that the, the landowner calls his steward and uh, in verse 8 and 9, and he calls the laborers and he gives them their wage. And so beginning with the, with the last to the first, the workers received a denarius. So he begins with the five o'clock hires first. And he pays them to their utter shock and amazement and pure joy a full day's wage. He gives them 12 times, and actually more than that, but 12, at least 12 times what they, were, what they deserved. And they were blowing their minds because they're thinking, well, I'm just I'm going to come back with a twelfth of a penny. That doesn't sound very good, you know. And and they're going to have to present that to their family and say, I can't pay the bill. I can't. We can't eat the food. It's just like this is just barely enough to, to eke out some small portion of a meal for our dinner. And simultaneously to the the joy of these five o'clock hires, the expectation level of the 6 a.m. hires begins to rise. Can you see why? And they're thinking, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. We've got to, I mean, this is like, you know, the person that leaves a $10,000 tip that you read about, you know. It's like, okay, something good is coming, you know. I, I mean, the, 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 all the indicators are that I'm going to get a bomb of a day here. It's going to be incredible because if those guys who worked for 45 minutes, got a full day's wage, what do I have coming to me, you know? Well, the steward pays them a denarius, and they're angry. Now, remember, Sumphoneo, they were in complete harmony at the beginning of the day. They were glad to be hired. They were thankful to be hired. They appreciated having a job. They were excited to be able to put food on the table, but now they have a different expectation a different sense of entitlement, and they're not happy. And it says in the text of verse 10 that they expected to receive more. This word is nomizo in the Greek. And nomizo means to suppose. I want to say that as I studied this text and, and um, 
really prayed about this and meditated, and I thought, wow, wow, suppose must be a dangerous word. Supposing and conjecturing and beginning to allow my mind to kind of run wild with what I think is right. Because, see, that's what I did in my conversation with the Lord down at Lydgate so many years ago. I was supposing. I was kind of thinking about myself. I was comparing myself to God, and I was saying, you know, God, I wasn't saying I was better than God, but in the end, that's exactly what I was saying. But in my mind, I was just thinking, this wouldn't even dawn on me to do this to you, but you're doing this to me. And I began to suppose. It's a really interesting thing when we get away from what Scripture teaches and what the promises actually reveal, and we move on to supposing. It's a dangerous place. And for these workers... They, uh, they were no longer content with their original agreement, but they began to compare and to assume and to suppose, which actually led them into sin. In 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 10, Paul very clearly says it's a dangerous thing and an unwise thing to compare ourselves with ourselves. And I'll, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. So they received their denarius, but they weren't happy because it seemed communistic. It seemed socialistic. It seemed that there is equality to the detriment of the people that actually put the the hardest work in. And, uh, and I want to answer that, that question for a moment here because it would be easy even for us to say, well, yeah, it does seem like it doesn't matter what you do. Work come late, come late, come early. You know, uh, those that have been working in the kingdom of God as Christians and serving all their lives and saying no to sin and yes to righteousness and, and really doing all those things, at the end of the day, it's all even Stephen and everybody gets in to the kingdom of heaven and everything is equal. And so what's the, what, where's the incentive and, and I want to tell you that I do believe God has put an incentive into the kingdom of God and established that. But let me talk about the equality first, because I think that the Bible is clear that every citizen of the kingdom of God is going to enjoy the corporate benefits of that kingdom. So every citizen, regardless of whether they came in late or early or whether they served diligently or they kind of slacked off, you know, everybody that God deems appropriate for his kingdom, having said that, it, there's going to be great variation in the kingdom of heaven in terms of how we conducted ourselves and the kind of fruit that we, that we bore in our life. And yet, listen to this short list that I came up with, and I'm, it's, it, 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 it could go on and on. I'm just going to give you a short list of the things that comprehensively the corporate body of Christ, regardless of performance in this kingdom, in this life, for that life, this is what God says will occur. You will be reconciled to God. That's across the board. Across the board, every person in the kingdom of heaven will have had their sins forgiven. Everyone will be called sons and daughters and be a part of the bride of Christ. Everyone will have access to the Father and to the Son and to the Spirit. Everyone will have a place prepared for them that's prepared before the foundation of the world by Christ. Everyone will receive their glorified bodies. Everyone will be at the wedding supper of the Lamb and everyone will have a role in the kingdom and the rule and the reign of the kingdom to come. That's amazing. That's a, you should be reminding yourself of that all year long. Whatever we face, all the bad news, all the stuff that comes, it's going to come. It's going to be a challenging year in some respects, but I want to suggest to you that the harder the year is in the global community, in the economic forecasts, in the politics, in the, in the socioeconomic issues, and in the, in the moral and ethical issues of our day, the greater the light shines in the midst of that opportunity. This is our shining hour as the church. This is not the end or the doom of the church. We're just getting started because God is going to let our light shine brighter and brighter and brighter until the full light of day, the scripture says. This is, this is the hour that God has given the church to step forward and to be a part of this great work. So having said that, it almost reminds me of, of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence of the United States when our founding forefathers said that we have inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But after that, nothing is guaranteed, right? It just gives you the basis. It gives you the foundation. It says everybody that's a citizen of this kingdom has opportunity. Every one of the citizens of this kingdom have certain privileges and certain uh, guarantees, but they're minimal. 
over against this opportunity to take those guarantees and that safety and that protection and that privilege and that freedom and then go nuts and do whatever you want to excel and to use your giftings and your talents and your abilities and to create and to be adventurous and to use your entrepreneurial skills and to advance the cause of Christ. I mean, you get the idea. It's like you can just do anything you want in the United States to create benefit for yourself and for people around you. That's what the, the United States was founded upon. But, but you see the erosion of that understanding of what the rights give us, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And now we have and free health care and free phones and free housing. And now we've got free college education for the first two years at, at uh, um, uh, community colleges that's being proposed. And over and over and over this expansion so that there is this socialistic, communistic equality which leads to poverty, financial poverty and spiritual poverty. And it looks like that the, that the kingdom of heaven might be a little bit like that, but it's not. Because in addition to these corporate blessings that are part of this kingdom that accrue to everyone because of the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there is another complete layer that the Bible talks about. And I'm just going to reference it briefly. And that's simply this that in addition to these corporate benefits that everyone receives, which is what this text is talking about, there are going to be rewards that are particular to individuals and uh, citizens based on their faithful service to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There are two judgment seats in the Bible. One is the great white throne judgment for unbelievers where they will be doled out their punishment, degrees of punishment. It's all bad, but there are degrees of badness in, in, in hell. And also, on the other hand, you have the Bema seat judgment, which is spoken of in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that is the place of rewards. It's the, it's the Olympic podium where believers will be allowed to stand and, and receive a blessing and a reward. No punishment, no shame, no videos of what we did in our life that was embarrassing. Just God's favor and God's blessing for what we accomplished with the freedoms that he established and allowed us in his kingdom on this earth for the short period of time. It's, it's a, this kingdom, the earthly kingdom, is a, is a short kingdom. It is not an everlasting kingdom. It's a temporal kingdom, but the kingdom to come is eternal, and it will never end. And he says, if you decide in that temporal kingdom to live and behave as citizens of my kingdom, which is what Matthew is all about, the king and the realm and the citizenry of the kingdom, if you decide in this life, in this fallen realm, to live as citizens of my future realm for my glory and praise, there is going to be reward for that that excels and exceeds the corporate benefits of everyone. Now remember, think about what the corporate benefits are. I mean, they're walking on streets paved with gold. There's peace. There's joy. No more tears. No more sadness. Just all, this, all the things that God promises corporately to everyone that comes into the kingdom of God is so fantastic. I can only imagine what the rewards will be like for those that serve faithfully in this fallen world in his vineyard. Well, in verse 11, we find that these men complained against the landowner. Uh, they suddenly felt wronged and defrauded and cheated and offended. And, um, and they made their, their accusation known uh, to the landowner and said, you know, we've borne the heat of the day. We've worked the long hours. And, and essentially, they were jealous and envious of these other men that had worked. It doesn't say that there weren't women there, but in our, in our case, it would be men and women. And, um, and, and so they're actually now jealous. They were fine with the wage, symphoneo, initially, but now they're jealous and envious because they look to the right and to the left. And have you ever done that? Have you ever looked at somebody else's life and said, why, why, do they, why am I going through all this? And look at them, and, and we're, we're really serving the Lord, and they're not, you know? And, and, and why, why, why the health problems, and why the family problems, and why this and why that? So dangerous. It's such a trap to pull us away from a kingdom mindset is comparing, but these men made uh, the mistake of, of doing so. And uh, by the way, it's the same problem that the prodigal son's brother made. Because if you remember the prodigal son's story in uh, Luke chapter 15, both sons received their inheritance. 
the older son wasn't defrauded of anything. He received exactly what the father said he would give him. But he was just so angry that this, you know, castaway, irresponsible, wine-bibbing brother and, uh, and lecherous guy went off and got all of that, and he still got his, but it just didn't seem right. A fairness issue. It's like, it's just a, it's a real trap. So if we ever find ourselves complaining or grumbling or comparing ourselves to others and resenting them, or accusing God of being unfair, and these are all things that are in Scripture, uh, or saying, as they did in Malachi chapter 3, verse 14, that it's useless and of no profit to serve God, then you're in trouble and I'm in trouble. So I want to I apply this a little bit more specifically, if you'll allow me to for a moment here. Every time we complain, whether it's out loud or not, whether, whether we're, you know, having a tantrum or that we're so refined that we keep it to ourselves and manage to zip our lips and we have that self-control. But as you know, God looks at the heart, not just at the outward behavior. So every time we complain against our spouse or our circumstances or our boss or someone in the church, every time we grumble and find fault, every time that we make an accusation against someone or even against God, uh, every time that we feel like, well, what's it really worth serving God? You know, I mean, I've been serving God this and that and the other thing, and he, I pray and he's not answering my prayer, and I've, I've cried out to God. I mean, I fasted, I prayed, and he still didn't answer. You know, so we got this, you know, real attitude, you know, going. And every time we do that, what we're really saying is that we stop being grateful for the symphoneo that we began with, the contentment. I was thinking about this myself, and I've been, uh, of course, convicted by this message. Um, and as I, as I think about that, I thought, wow, how, how much of my time am I actually spending being grateful over against, you know, trying to work out a problem? You know, constantly, I'm a guy. Maybe the gals are a little bit different, uh, but I think we all struggle with this, where we, we spend an awful lot of our time looking at what's not right to fix what's not right so we can have everything right. Does that make sense? So we might have like 90% of our life right, but we spend most of our time on the 10% so that we can get this, which is disrupting our 90% of our joy, uh, so we can get that right, and, but the, unfortunately, we always have 10%, it seems, or 20, or 50, right? And we, ne we rarely get to 100, which means that we're rarely content, and we're rarely at this place of peace with God and contentment with what He's given us. It's a real trap. And, and what it does is it takes people out of the mission. It takes people off the, out of the vineyard. It takes them out of the game because they're, they're no longer thinking about what a joyful thing it is to be forgiven of their sins, what an incredible blessing it is to, to have the favor and the love of God, to have the Holy Spirit residing in us, to have divine appointments, to, to be living for eternity, to have the promise of eternal life and the kingdom to come, and all the, all the thousands of promises that are contained in the Scripture for this life and the life to come. And, and we, we've got all of this, but we'll sit there and we'll mope and be depressed about little tiny things in the bigger picture. And so I, I've, I've really been asking the Holy Spirit to change my heart. And it may sound a little silly, but I found myself kind of fascinated with all kinds of things in life. Like I, this is just, I don't even know why I'm telling you this, but it's just how silly it is. Um, I was walking up the stairs in her house the other day, and I thought, this is amazing. I'm navigating stairs. That's a miracle. Thank you, Lord. And it's not because I'm 54. I know some of you are thinking he's so old that he's, he's, he's surprised he can walk a set of stairs. Um, but I started thinking about this, and I thought, wow, I'm alive. I, I mean, I'm, right now, I'm so thankful. It's like, is everything right in my life? Do I have all the ducks in a row, and is all my... No, it's not. I, I could easily concentrate on the 10 or 15 or 20 percent of stuff that, that's disrupting my peace and be pulled out of the mission and off the, out of the vineyard and out of the harvest. But I don't want to live that way. And I want to be in the game constantly. And so I'm just finding myself being grateful for things. And the result is, is that I'm just, I still struggle. I won't lie to you. I'm not up here having solved this dilemma. And every day it's just like, oh, I'm just so happy to be alive. And you know my line. It's like, I'm not burning in hell. This is great, you know? Um, and I do believe that. I think that's a, that's a big remedy. That's like a pill you should be taking every day. You're not burning in hell. That's what you deserve. If you really want you, what you deserve... You don't really want what you deserve, do you? You don't want that. And God doesn't want that for you either. He wants grace for you. 
He wants tenderness. He wants love. He wants, to, he wants to show you his magnificent glory, and he wants you to be involved in it. He wants you to be a sharer in it. He wants you to be rewarded for really what is mostly him, and he invites us into it and says, come along and be a part of the harvest. And so God gives us the choice. I want to share with you, I, it's, um, there's a thousand ways that Satan derails believers. But this is one of the secret, hidden, very nefarious things that he does that a lot of times we're not catching on to. Is that we, we, we're grumbling and we're complaining and we just kind of have this attitude about that 10 or 15% of our life that's not in order like we'd like it in order. And I, I'm, I'm convinced, as I've told you before, I'm never going to get all of it in order. There might be a, a couple of little windows in life where for 15 minutes everything is perfect. But other than that, it just seems like life is a, is a rolling process of me learning how to trust God. And I think what God is really doing, friends, is he's testing us and he's saying, do you love me more than these? Do, do you love the kingdom? Do you love what I've promised? Are you content? Is there a symphoneo between us about the things of our agreement? Or do you have a sense of entitlement? Are you disappointed and envious and jealous? Do you feel I've wronged you? Do you feel I've defrauded you in some way? And of course, we know that God is absolutely righteous and absolutely just and perfect in all of his dealings with us. We're the problem. But Satan uses this very insidious tool of discontent to take us out of the game. That's his objective. He doesn't, he's not worried about you having a bad attitude. He wants you off the, the bench or out of the game. He wants you out of the vineyard. He doesn't want you working. And so if he can get you absorbed with the unfairness of God and the unfairness of life and, and the problems, good enough for him. So the landowner responds in verse 13 and 14, and we'll finish here fairly quickly by reviewing the facts. And he says, I love how he addresses these guys. He says, friend, I, I, you know, it's like, he gets beat up, he's insulted, he's, he's assaulted verbally, he's, he's disparaged by these guys, and he's a landowner, he hired them and he paid them exactly what he promised, and they trash him, and he calls them friends. Wow, we have a very loving God who is even forgiving of our insults that we've committed against him, and all of us, I believe, at one point or another have done this, and yet he still calls us his friends. He says, didn't you agree with, a, with me for a denarius? And he says, isn't it up to me to do what I want with my own money? And you see, God, God will never be guilty of being less than fair, but it's entirely God's prerogative to be more than fair should he choose to do so. He's never less than fair with any of us, but if he chooses to be more than fair with some, that's his prerogative. So when you see him treating people that you think that you're better than in some way and he's favoring them and blessing them and giving them work and helping them and they're so joyful in the Lord, don't ever disparage that because that's a sign of just the favor of a generous God who, if he hasn't already done that with you in your life, he will. He's very kind and very generous. And so there is no unrighteousness of God. And, and the landowner says, or is your eye evil because I'm good? And Pony Ross, evil, means inherently bad, which we are. we are. We are capable of doing good. An unbeliever is capable of doing good, but intrinsically we're evil. And over against the landowner who describes himself as good, agathos, which means intrinsically good, in other words, God is not only able to do good, but he is good. And because of that contrast, these guys were stumbled. And so he finishes by saying, the last will be first and the first last. And many, many are called and few are chosen. I will say that that particular final phrase is not found in the oldest manuscripts and so is not even noted in some of your Bibles. Um, but I think the principle is still true, uh, which uh, in essence uh, you know, has some instruction and value even as it relates to the free will and the election debate. But suffice it to say that this parable teaches us much about the kingdom of God. It tells us that there's a king. 
It tells us that there's a realm of his area of responsibility. It gives us his agenda. It tells us that, that there's a, a possibility and opportunity for us as laborers in, in the Lord to either just kind of squeak into the kingdom of God and receive the... I, this, there's, no hand, there's no way to describe it except just fabulous and glorious and, and you know, beyond luxurious benefits that accrue to everyone that calls on the name of Christ. And in God's economy, all I can tell you is that there's more. There's more. And if you think that's great, then you're going to absolutely blow your mind when you stand on that Bema seat podium and you receive the reward of your Savior and of your King, Jesus Christ. It will be worth it all. It's a great parable, a great reminder. And so God is no man's debtor, and we have the opportunity to be a part of the work. If there's anyone here that's never received Christ, you've never accepted him as your Savior, that's the beginning point. That's how you enter in. It's like, it's like you know how you become a citizen of the United States, how you're supposed to become a citizen of the United States? <laughs> run across the border. You don't even have to run anymore. You get, uh, like, invited. There's a bus, I think. Uh, but, uh, but normally... Uh, you go through a process to become an American citizen. And it's a glorious graduation. It's an incredible experience, and it's filled with joy. And it provides you with a whole series of incredibly wonderful benefits to be a, a member of the United States of America and a citizen. And in the same way for someone that's never received Christ before, you're outside the kingdom of God. You are not a citizen of the kingdom of God. And God's very clear about how you become a citizen you make pono with him, and pono means to make it right. You confess your sin, and, and this is what God wants if you want to be in a, a citizen of his kingdom. Admit that you've sinned, that you've violated the relationship with him, that you're guilty of the, the Ten Commandments, or, or some of them at least, if not all of them, and that you, you violated this covenant relationship and that you're not worthy to be in this holy, pure, undefiled kingdom with a holy and pure and undefiled God. And repent of that sin, meaning you're not going to go back to it and live like like you did before. And you're going to make your life geared towards serving him because now you're in the kingdom of your king with an agenda for the citizenry of those, that realm. And if you want to do that, the Bible says all you have to do is call on him and he'll hear you and he'll answer and he'll forgive your sins. And at the moment that you do that, you're transitioned from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Christ. So if you've never done that, please, by all means, Come see me or any of our leaders. A lot of people in our church, in fact, most everybody here that's a regular knows how to lead people to Christ and can help you do that. So uh, if you want to do that, that would be great to do. For the rest of us, I'm, I'm like ready to go to war against spiritual poverty. Are you with me? I want to go to war against spiritual poverty. I'm not against people. I'm against the darkness. I'm against the, the kingdom of our enemy. And, and to go to war means that I need to be willing and available and ready. War. Let's go to war. There, there is a great harvest out there. And, and the Lord is looking across the face of the globe for men and women whose hearts are devoted to him and to his agenda, which is a great harvest in these last days. He's almost here. The king is coming. I don't know if it'll be this year or next year, but our king is coming. Be ready, serve, obey, honor, bring glory to, and and bring praise to the one and only true God who in the end of the day will not only allow you to enjoy the corporate benefits of the kingdom of God, but will assign to each of you by name the reward that he determines for your faithful service. Just my personal opinion, I think it's going to make the corporate blessings I wouldn't say look bad because they don't look bad. But I think it's going to surprise us how important that time is. Far more important than I think most people give credit for. And so be a person who goes into your Savior's presence with your arms filled with fruit, with good fruit, with lasting fruit, with much fruit to his glory and praise. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And um, we're very grateful to belong to you. All the corporate benefits that you've promised us in your word are just phenomenal. And I don't think maybe any of us have given enough time to think about the particular personal blessings that will come 
from your hand toward us in the form of crowns and, and responsibilities and authority and privilege in the kingdom to come. Not everything is going to be equal. The corporate blessings will all be shared. There'll be, there'll be equality, but there is a place for your favor and blessing on those who serve well. God, I pray every man and every woman would serve well. I pray I would serve well. And I thank you, God, for this church, this loving, devoted, um, passionate group of men and women that have excelled at all these things, God. And all I ask, God, is help us to excel still more for your glory in the days in which we're living. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and we'll close with one last worship song.